What's shaking, cats and kittens? Rob Lee here for this month's presenting sponsor, Night Owl Gallery. Night Owl Gallery is an intimate, artist-run exhibition space showcasing the original paintings and fine art prints of Beth Ann Wilson. Also, it features curated goods from local artists and craftsmen. You'll be sure to find one-of-a-kind gifts, handcrafted jewelry, home decor items, along with a few vintage treasures. Located in the rear of 248 South Conklin Street in Highland Town, across from its Sally O's, Night Owl Gallery is a unique space that brings together Wilson's love of the arts, community, and culture. Additionally, Night Owl Gallery hosts an array of arts and crafts workshops throughout the year and participates in community events, many of which are free and open to the public. So in this ever-changing world, safety is their priority. So feel free to join them and hit them up online at www.nightowl.gallery. Tell them Rob Lee sent you. Welcome to Getting to the Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. You should know this by now. Uh, today's guest is a paper cut artist and educator from West Philadelphia. We have Rosa Leff. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you. I am actually a former educator, technically. Oh. Walked away from the day job. I decided to, you know, just go for it and paper cut all the time. I dig it. Then we've, well, you're going to educate some people on the process of paper cutting. So That's true. yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, I always find a way to make it that I'm right. No, I'm kidding. Um, so Fair enough. <laughs> real, real quick, real quick, or however long you want to talk about it, but um, d- describe what your, your work is about. Cause when people hear paper cut artists or have you, um, or the, just the concept of, of paper cutting, you're like, what's that? So, and I'm sure you've answered this hundreds of times, what have you, but feel free to go back into it, if you will. Yeah. People don't know what paper cutting is. Uh, so it's, I always like make the comparison. If you can picture the last time you were hanging out in a bar at Cinco de Mayo and you saw those little paper flags hanging from the ceiling, I do that. Um, of course the traditional Mexican papel picado is very different. It's, uh, you know, with hammer and chisels and tissue paper, but I'm basically using a tiny knife and I'm, uh, sculpting essentially I'm cutting away at these sheets of paper, until I have a finished cityscape. Um, so I, I know you said you got your little exacto there, gave it a shot, mm-hmm. and might've been a little yeah. bit harder than you expected. Uh, <laughs> I tend to work yes. for my original photographs. So I, you know, when I travel, uh, I'm taking tons and tons of photos and then kind of combing back through them when I get home. And of course, you know, Baltimore and Philly are both cities that I know really well. So I can be a little bit more targeted with my photography there because I know what to look for. Or I know what's gonna, you know, if something jumps out at me, I know why it's jumping out at me and I can tell yeah. like, Hey, pull over the car. I got to cut that building. Um, so I print out these images and I tape them down into a second sheet of paper. That's, you know, the art paper and I cut through both layers. And what's challenging about it is that I'm using the photograph as a stencil, but of course a photo, even if you make it black and white still has a gray scale. So I'm doing a lot of interpreting as I go along and, uh, something that's just a point of pride for me and my like anal mindset about paper cutting is just making sure that everything connects. So you can pick them up by the corner. Everything's going to stay attached. Um, I don't attach my paper cuts to my backgrounds if I can avoid it. Like I very rarely use adhesives. So it really is a freestanding, just like single sheet of paper with holes in it. Wow. (laughs) Um, so I, I heard that, and maybe I read this, um, I, I heard that your, your paper cutting, so I listened to a podcast that you were on and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it, but I had to do a little research. Um, but I heard that your, your, your work um, kind of started because of a uh, grad school project. Speak more about that. Yeah. Um, so one of our projects was to create a children's book. And I just like, I always say grad school is stressful. And even if you like want the end game of it, nobody really wants to do the grad school part. Uh, So I was just like not feeling it stressed out. I did a full year of student teaching as part of my program. And so I had to create this children's book and I'm thinking like, I'm not feeling the writing. I don't want to do this. Like, let me just put too much effort into the art itself, into the illustrations. And it was kind of just a therapeutic thing at the time, Um, but I really enjoyed it. And it was the first time that I had bought, like bought an X-Acto knife. First time I had used an X-Acto knife. I bought myself this little tiny rotary mat so I wouldn't screw up my kitchen table, like cutting into it. And the work that I did for that children's book is so completely different from anything that I do now. I was really, um, you know, inspired by some collage style illustrations. Um, there's a lot of people, of course, working in that uh, vein. Eric Carl and Ezra Deck Keats are always two of my favorites that I call out. I think two of everybody's like childhood classic favorites. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I was doing similar work to that, but incorporating a lot of uh, Islamic tile patterns and different geometric patterns into it. 
and I just really enjoyed the medium and I kind of took off from there. It's great to hear. Actually, it's, um, it's almost as if you, you have the questions because this kind of segues into my next question. Um, so so speak a little bit more. You, you touched on it. Um, so speak a little bit more on how you developed stylistically from your earlier work to to now. Absolutely. So, I mean, those early, early pieces that I did were very much just about like, how do the patterns look? Can I keep consistent line weights? If I'm cutting a series of triangles, can I actually get them all the same size, which sounds like it's super simple, but sometimes the knife gets a little bit uh, out of control there if you're not being careful with it. Uh, so that's where I started with it. And then I decided to try and see what I could do with it. Uh, and I really, it's funny because I don't really read graphic novels often, but I'm really drawn mm -hmm. to the illustrations like that's what's going to get me hooked if the art is good then i want to read it so i was okay, thinking yeah. a lot of like will eisner pieces and kim jung ji and getting into all of that and started you know using those as a way of teaching myself which i have like i didn't go to art school but i have a lot of arts background and when i was learning to paint i was you know copying paintings from great masters and when i was learning to draw i was copying you know rembrandt's etchings or whatever and i think i like kind of got myself to do the same thing with paper cutting but i didn't have enough of the background knowledge to know about paper cutters who came before me. So I was just looking at like these graphic novel illustrations and saying, okay, what can I do? Uh, and then I think a huge turning point for me in that was that I came across an etching by uh, Gustave Dore based on Dante's Inferno. Yeah. So that was the first piece that I was like, okay, I love this image. I don't know if I can cut this, but I'm going to try. <laughs> so it was like my huge push. And I spent like months working on this. And it's funny now because it would take me like a couple of weeks, but I spent months working on it. And I was like, I just want to get my lines as tight as I can. I want to make sure there's no fuzzy pulls in the corners. Like I want this to be absolutely perfect. I don't know how it didn't end up in the recycling bin because I got so frustrated with it. <laughs> Uh, but I finished it and I was really proud of it. So I like, it was the first piece that I decided I was like, I'm going to shell out the big box. I'm going to take this to go get custom framed because I think I did a really great job. I'm really excited about this. And I took it into uh, Blick in Philly. And there's a guy working at the frame shop, Justin Sipa. And he like saw it and he's like, did you do this? I was like, yeah. He's like, so you made it? He's like questioning me. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I made it with a little exacto knife. And he's like, no, I see it's a paper cut. And he called somebody on the PA system. And he's like, you got to come check this out. And so I was like, oh, people really like these. Like there's something to be done here. And yeah, uh, yeah still kept cutting. That, that sounds great. It's, it's really, it's really cool. Like I've had, um, I, I guess if I would describe it and maybe use the same terminology, I don't know. Um, but I would describe like kind of you're, you're a kind of self-taught artist, artist and, you know, there are different viewpoints on it. I have some people who have that, who I've interviewed, who had that chip on their shoulder. How dare you? They'll, they'll have galleries and, and people will come to them. Like I could do better work than you. Just like, go ahead. <laughs> Here's the invitation. Um, yeah. so from, from, from your vantage point, do you encounter that in any way where is this, this notion of, what you're doing there is almost like this kind of second guessing of it. It's like, I know it's a lot of work here, but I could do that. Do you ever run into that? Or how do you feel about the notion of being in that self-taught artist kind of space? Definitely. But I don't know that it's necessarily connected to being self-taught. Like for me, that's kind of a point of pride. Um, and I think that that's something that's just part of folk art and, you know, folk art and craft versus fine art is this whole other debate that people get into. And me, I'm like, I don't care. Does it look cool? Like, did somebody refine some really awesome talent and produce something that's awesome at the end of it, then it's art. And I don't really, yeah. uh, you know, give too much weight to what the delineations are aside from that. But I definitely encounter every so often a venue that's <laughs> like, Oh, that's cute. Take that to a craft fair. And it's just like, okay, you're not my people. Goodbye. And then, you know, there are other people who are super excited about it because they've never seen anything like it, or they are familiar with paper cuts, but they're more used to silhouettes or just very traditional motifs um, which, you know, tend to be a lot of florals and things like that. So they're not used to seeing an abandoned factory and a chain link fence. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think I bring something unique to it. And I definitely, especially from the public, will sometimes have people, they kind of try and do the math a little bit. So they'll like yeah. see me working and then they try and figure out how long it takes. And then they want to know why the pricing mm -hmm. is what it is. Or I had one uh, really strange experience. I was working at the Torpedo Factory. I rented out a studio there and I did a small group show, just me and this artist, Sally Canzanari, who's a DC photographer. And some woman came in while I was like working in the studio and she's looking around. She goes, 
so people pay you for this? And she's like, yes. <laughs> and she's like, oh, but like, you're showing us how you do it because you know, I was like live cutting. She's like, yeah. so why wouldn't I just go home and make it myself? Like, I hope you do. Good luck. Like, I wish there were more paper cutters. Right. <laughs> she left and she came back like 10 minutes later and she goes, were your parents disappointed that you became an artist? She's like, wow. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> So people have their own, you know, ideas yeah. and associations with craft and art in general. And it's just not something that you can give too much weight to because you'll make yourself crazy trying to figure out what goes on inside of everybody else's brains. Absolutely. I, I've given up on that um, maybe 15 minutes ago. And <laughs> I, I will say one of the um, I, I think one of the oldest uh, pieces of art that I'm familiar with, I know my mom still has it because moms, uh, it's uh, silhouettes of my brother and I when we were kids. And um, it just reminds me of how big my damn head is. And I'm like, come on, <laughs> can we put that away? And I had like a rat tail too. So it was, I, I, I tried to pawn it off. Like, oh, I had corals. I was cool. It's like, no, I had a rat tail. This was in 1991. Yeah. So yeah, you can, like, take times. your exacto knife and smooth that down, cut off the rat tail. Just a little bit, just a little bit, you know, keep the coolness. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that that's a, it's an interesting thing. Like um, you, you can't get into it when people look at what you're doing or what they think you're doing and try to fill in the blanks and tell a story about it. I'm in this spot where I have to, because I've gotten old, I have to turn down my degree of ignorance because I want to be ignorant. Because I remember like when I got started in podcasting 12 years ago, and I remember how people viewed me then. And I know all of my ins and outs of what I do. And now it's just like everyone is like, hey, man, a podcaster. It's like, oh, huh. Remember, this wasn't a thing. Remember that? Remember that? <laughs> remember how people weren't making money from it and all of these different things? Or you must live in your mom's basement, right? It's like, yeah, but what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that's none of your business. It's not yeah, really anything. It, right. <laughs> so, so I, I'll say this: I we, met you last week in person, and that was really cool. Um, and your work saw it, uh, and you you touched on the process a bit. Um, so your work is beautiful, detailed, intricate. Mm -hmm. I I I can't do it. I, yeah, I ain't gonna go go there. How? How do you stay focused? What helps you stay focused? And, um, and, and when you're in like that work setup, you're like, you're in the zone, what keeps you focused and what helps you stay focused? I'm honestly very lucky. And that most of the time, like 99% of the time, the focus is just comes naturally to me. Um, and I don't find myself wanting to leave my studio. And at some point, like a dog will come up to me and be like, Hey, you need to walk me. You need to do other things than art today. Or my husband will be like, hey, you haven't eaten yet. And it's like, oh, right. Dinner is a thing that people do. I should go take care of that. Um, so nice. because I have that like natural desire to be in my studio all the time, I really don't worry about it. If I have that, you know, 1% that day when I'm just not feeling it, I kind of let myself take that day. Um, of course, there are times when you have to push through. If I have a commission, if I have deadlines going on. Um, but my, my work is really very meditative. So if I'm not in the zone for whatever reason, there's usually a reason and I can kind of meditate myself out of it. Dig it. I, I'm, I'm that way. Not when it, when it comes to conversations, because, uh, I tell people all the time, I'm very shy, but, um, they're like, Oh, you're great. You have a great voice. You know how to talk to people, but the, the meditative uh, component of this, which I've kind of delegated to someone else, um, uh, would be the editing portion. It's like, Oh, let me go back through and, be be anal about everything that I said. It's like, ugh, I kind of said um too many times or something like that. But that that is kind of like really being dipped into it and just it's a whole immersive setup. I'll have these headphones on, the lights are probably off. I might be smoking a J. Who knows? But I'm in that that kind of setup and I'm going through through my process. And you know, at one point, like I said, in the 12 years I've been doing this. I used to do five podcasts a week. So I was editing all of them yeah. and I would just be in there like, okay, this, this has to go out by Tuesday and this has to go out by Wednesday. And then two are going out on Friday and it's just deadlines with having a day job and just trying to make these things work. And now I look at myself, I was like, how the hell did I do that? And I was like, maybe I was just in that zone then. I think so, you're in the zone. And if you're not in the zone, then you're pushing yourself in a way that's not healthy. And I think that's something that's really interesting about when I started. So I 
announced that I was leaving teaching in February, right before the pandemic hit. So I like got free of all of that guilt of like, no, I'm not abandoning you in your time of need. So I finished out the school year with my kindergartners on Zoom. But now I had all this time where I was like in isolation, couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do anything. Baltimore, we were like fully shut down still. Mm -hmm. Um, So there was nothing to distract me from my studio practice. So I think I developed some habits that now that things are opening back up will hopefully, you know, keep me grounded and keep me uh, at a reasonable routine. Yeah. Pe- people have been able to pick those things up. And um, a lot, I think some people, some people picked up some bad habits, but I think a lot of people have been able to pick up things, especially in, in their creative practice where um, I, I look at it this way, what albums and things like that, what movies and scripts and things like that were crafted during this time. And mm-hmm. you get to see really who was working and who was messing around uh, and who was just gaining like 50 pounds. And there's nothing wrong with gaining 50 pounds, I, I, I guess. <laughs> you know, whatever, it's fine. Um, so share, share some of your strongest influences from your youth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I mentioned that my grandmother was an artist and, uh, you know, she was an oil painter, but she always just had a really strong appreciation for illustration. So it was something that, well, you know, I was adopted by that part of my family. My father was my stepfather technically. So I got my grandmother as a bonus when I was eight. And um, she always selected children's books based on the illustrations. Like, I really don't think she cared at all what the story was, but she would sit down to like read me a bedtime story, but she's just talking about the pictures the whole time. Um, So in a sense, I think, you know, her presence and her teaching me like her own version of a picture is worth a thousand words really meant a lot for me. And also just, you know, her taking me seriously as an artist, even though I was a terrible oil painter because I was eight years old, like that still (laughs) um, definitely, you know, taught me that art was something that you have to keep practicing at. And it's really interesting to me that I think especially in the public education system, we have this, oh, you're not great at reading. You're not great at mathematics. So these are things that you have to work at, things that you have to get better at. But for some reason, we allow kids to just say like, oh, I'm not good at art Mm -hmm. and call it a day. And it's not a thing that we say, no, no, you have to practice this. You have to develop these skills, Um, which I think is really unfortunate because even if you never have any intention of making a career out of it or anything like that, you know, people have this desire to have a creative outlet. And I think that's why things like these paint nights have become so prolific that people are just looking for some way to relax. It involves creativity and expression in some way. Yeah. I mean, uh, when I was crafting the, the, the idea around this podcast and this is going on like two and a half, almost three years for this particular podcast. And, um, I've had some people who, they didn't think that they were artists or they didn't think that they were creatives because we, we have this system as you kind of touched on that gives you these ideas that, Oh, if you, you can abandon that. You're not good at that or, or what have you. And you see this creative sense expressed in maybe something else. It might be, Oh, you make really dope candles or you make really great drinks. It's like, there is some artistry to that. Let's not undersell it. And there were a few that would reach out to me afterwards because some people I'm friends with after the pod, I don't just use y'all, but, um, we'll reach out. And it's like, man, really thank you for helping me like realize like that. I actually am creative and I actually am an artist. And I was like, Oh, okay. you know, <laughs> good job. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, points for me. Uh, yeah. so you, you touched on it earlier of the, the two places you would know, best as, as far as um, within the work that you're, you've been doing, you touched on Baltimore, you touched on Philly. Um, how, how do the art scenes compare between the, the two cities? I think there's a lot of similarities, but um, what is your take? You know, it's interesting because I, of course, I'm a Philly girl. So I, that's where I started out my arts career. But when I started, I didn't have any reputation or any name. So I know that I was like perceived one way entering into the art world there. And then when I came to Baltimore, I had a little bit of a reputation. So to me, Baltimore feels so, so welcoming as an art scene. And it's like anybody who I contact, who I reach out to via email or, you know, walk up to at an event has been so friendly. But there's also part of me that kind of wonders is like, oh, is that because I actually like have a few accomplishments under my belt at this point? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, you know, maybe people, when I first started off in Philly and I don't want to say anything bad about Philly, we get a negative reputation for being a little grumpy, but people might have been initially a little bit more closed off, but that could also be that I was just like brand new, you know, I didn't know what I was doing yet. And I hadn't refined my skills as much. 
um, going back and forth. I think I get the best of both worlds and I love that they're so close together. And, you know, in non-pandemic times, I'm in Philadelphia once or twice a month, but of course I get to take advantage of everything that's going on in Baltimore, which is awesome. I think the main difference in the art scenes is really that Baltimore has a ton of venues and spaces for uh, creatives. And there's a lot of that like locavore support and culture, which is awesome. And Philly, I think that tends to be a bit more neighborhood by neighborhood. Sure. Um, but of course, Philly is also being a bigger city. There's a much bigger, higher end art market. So that's one thing that's tough about Baltimore. That the uh, Philly um, and New Orleans were on my list of potential relocation places. I, and I do that thing of like, what's close and what seems similar? To Baltimore. And, you know, every time I've gone up to Philly, I usually in a very corny way, I usually go up there to South Philly and it's like, oh, let me go to the ECW arena. Let's see what a wrestling is popping. And that's literally what happens. And, you know, as I was telling you before we got started, the, the job I was considering taking was up there. And it is always giving me that vibe of like, all right, because I'm grumpy. And I was like, all right, I might be able to, you know, throw a few batteries at Santa Claus. And, you know, I know your sports teams have a, have a reputation. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's one of those things. And it's good to it's good to hear that you're that you actually, you know, spend some time there. You're able to see those those differences in this non-pandemic sort of sort of timeline. Um, let's see. Outside of I had to update my question. Outside of paper cutting, when you're not paper cutting, dot dot dot, what else do you enjoy doing? Uh, eating too much. I don't know. Wow. Wow. Outside of paper, I mean, I try to spend as much time outside as possible, which is kind of a funny answer because I am not outdoorsy. When I say I spend that time outside, I don't mean like hiking and I hear Maryland has beautiful parks. I don't know. I haven't seen them. I'm like, sitting on the deck. I've got a great view of a Harbor. I love that. Like, this is my favorite thing to come out of COVID that all of these like sidewalk cafes have kind of popped up. People are putting out lots more outdoor seating. I'm like, I hope we keep this. Uh, so, you know, I feel like I become a completely different person in the summertime. <laughs> so I'm very excited about that. And, uh, you know, and under normal circumstances, I travel a lot and that's been a big part of my art practice. So it's not that I necessarily go for my art. It might be that I'm just going to visit a friend or I'm just going on a vacation. Um, but I spend a lot of time walking around with my camera in hand. And again, obviously some of those photos then become paper cuts, but maybe for every one that does become a paper cut, there's another 2000 that never turn into anything. And it's just something that I do for fun. I dig it. So you, so traveling is a thing for you though. And I, and I, I like that. And that's one of the things I really miss. Um, I was, and I don't travel like a whole lot, but it would probably be like two to three times a year. And I, and I really miss that. And you know, what I like to do, like, um, one of my friends, that's the only person I really go traveling that travel with, uh, he hates that. I like to go to like the hood or wherever the place is. It's like, Oh yeah, this is, I was like, look, the food's going to be fire here. Absolutely. Like, I just remember we went to, um, to, to California. We were, we never, this is like the first time we'd been on the West coast and, uh, we went to um, Long Beach and I was saying like a lot of reckless stuff just <laughs> to be a troll. And he's like, can you stop? No. I was like, no. He's like, this is Compton. I was like, Compton is a suburb now. It's fine. I did my research. <laughs> and, um, and, and he's like a county guy or what have you. And I'm definitely from the city. So I was like, I know the difference. It's fine. No one's doing anything. We're going to see some sweaty wrestlers and eat hot dogs. It's fine. <laughs> and it's kind of one of those things like I really miss because it gives you content for stories or in your case, it gives you visual content, you know, one out of 2000. I mean, I don't know what percentage that is, but, <laughs> but it gives you, it gives you something to maybe base what you're doing on, or it's a conversation or, or something that you can utilize later that I think, um, you know, this last year or such, we've, we've kind of missed because I don't know how many people were recklessly going out there, but I was just, let me stay here. Let me, let me stay local. I'm not yeah. going to go down to Florida because tickets are cheap. I'm not going to do these, these different I'm things. I'm right there with you. And I don't think there's really, I wonder how much you can get from experiencing a lot of these tourist sites. Like my husband was making fun of me. We were talking about this earlier. We've both been to Italy, but separately. And he's like, so you weren't impressed by the Coliseum? And I was like, no, I've seen a million pictures of it. It looks the same. Like it looked exactly like I expected it to look. That's I, I know I'm going to upset people with that statement, but like, for me, it's much more about going into those neighborhood spots and wandering around in the residential areas that you don't see. And that's what gets me excited anywhere I go. 
And uh, our first big trip since the pandemic is we're going to Aruba next month. Two of our best friends are getting married. So we're super excited for that. But like when you think about Aruba, you picture beaches and just like relaxing, maybe a cocktail. I'm super yeah. excited to go to the donkey sanctuary. <laughs> That's what I want to hit when we're there. <laughs> How many people say I went on vacation to Aruba and I checked out the 130 free range donkeys. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's, that's great. I, w- the first time I went to new Orleans, I went to by myself and that was a show. I usually go for my birthday. So I'm kind of pre-planning my January trip and just waiting for uh, Southwest to open up things. It's like, Hey, we're booking for January. It's like, uh, let's get it. And when I went uh, the first time I went by myself and I was there with like, um, like uh, two, two older ladies that were, were there. And he said, Oh, you're here by yourself. That's brave. And then her friend was like, Oh, he's a big black guy though. So it's fine. And I was just like, but I thought it was also kind of hilarious because we were on a like vampire tour and we were talking, learning all of these terrible things that happened in new Orleans. And we were talking, hearing about how unsafe it was. So they're like freaking out because of some of the stories we're hearing. And I'm just like, ah, where's the booze? Cause it's, it's a drinking tour as well. So it's like something could happen and you hit all of these really like rough stories, but entertaining stories. Um, the one thing that I needed to do while I was down there was I needed to see an alligator, not in, not in person, but like in a zoo. And that's my favorite animal. So we, I go there and I do the whole zoo thing. And not only did I see an alligator, I saw an albino alligator and I was like, Oh, this is a thing. And that was just like, all right. Yeah. Some people came here for jazz and hurricanes. I came here to see an albino alligator and I got it. It, it happened. <laughs> this is great. I'm glad you got your albino alligator photo. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very happy about it. If I could have took it with him, I would have for her. I, I don't know what the gender of the alligator was. I don't know. Spectrums. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so is is there a project that, that comes to mind or any or any multiple or projects that come to mind that you're particularly proud of and why? Definitely. Um, so a, a more recent one that I'm really proud of is interesting because I learned a lot about it after I was finished with it. Um, so as I said, like a lot of my work is very meditative and sometimes that's I'm meditating while I'm paper cutting. And sometimes it's that I'm meditating and that's kind of where my ideas come from. Uh, and I had a not so idyllic childhood. And that's something that I think a lot of people, you know, you're taught, like, don't air out family laundry. Like you keep that to yourself or talk to a therapist or whatever. But of course, as artists, we're supposed to be like making our souls public. So it's how do you find this balance of telling your story and being authentic, but also kind of protecting the people that you care about. Um, So I did a piece called Let Them Eat Plate, which is about some of the, you know, times when I was younger where I had inconsistent uh, access to food. And that's something that people hear and then they go, oh my God, this poor child, she was starving all the time. And I'm like, no, no, inconsistent access. Like, You know, my family, I always say my family just wasn't good at budgeting. It's not that we didn't have money. It's just that money came in and we would buy all of these things. And then at the end of the month, there wasn't enough. And as an adult, I can realize there's a different way that we could have handled that. And maybe things would have been a little bit smoother the whole way through. Uh, Sure. But that was just really interesting for me to create this piece and then put it out into the world. And I actually submitted it as part of my application for the, uh, independent artists awards from the Maryland state arts council. So I got one of those awards and I, they do a jurying where you can't actually like say anything, but you can hear them talking about your work. So I'm listening to people say all of these things and like relating it to their childhoods and their poverty stories. And I just wanted to be like, no, no. And like advocate for my family and be like, you guys don't understand. You don't get it. (laughs) Of course. Like that's what art is, right? When you put something out there, it's going to be open to interpretation and wherever somebody else is coming from, uh, they're gonna, you know, have their own set of baggage or happy memories or whatever it is that they associate with that. And to me, it was a very playful piece. It's, uh, I think I said, it's called let them eat plate. And I used a really shiny kind of like metallic pink background for it. And I did this over the top brocade pattern and there's Marie Antoinette on it. And I cut it out of a paper plate. Uh, and I cut some like bite marks into the side of it. So to me, it like kind of captured that like levity and just like, I was a happy kid. I had a good life but there were hard times. And to me, it struck that perfect balance. And I think some people, when they see it, not knowing the story, they either go towards like one or the other extreme. Uh, So that was like an important lesson for me. I dig it. I I would imagine when you, when you mentioned the, um, 
the like the metallic pink I immediately thought of what you were wearing last week. And I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> Cause it's like that. Cause that's that that might be part of this next question. This is actually my last question. Um share a hidden talent that you possess. This is a new question. Hidden talent that you possess and share a skill that you do not possess but you admire in others. A hidden talent that I possess. I will say that I am okay. So I speak English and Spanish. I at one point spoke a decent amount of French, but when I'm preparing to travel to a place, I'm really good at learning a whole lot of phrases and functional language for that trip. I will forget it three weeks later because I don't keep using it for some reason. Like my brain is definitely programmed for language. So that's a good talent. Temporary polyglot. I get it. (laughs) Uh, Let's see something I wish I could do. This sounds silly. I've never been able to whistle. And I think at this point, it just bothers me that I can't whistle because I feel like I'm still hung up on, you know, being seven years old and everybody else could do it and I couldn't figure it out. And I've never really let go of that. And uh, (laughs) we were dating. My husband would try and give me lessons on it. He was really, really gentle soul about my deficiencies. But I just uh, I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, I'm I'm not good at it. I blamed it on lemons at one point. And I was like, when life gives you lemons, it stops you from whistling. That's that's pretty much what I learned. And yeah, and I love lemonade. So I, I too share this deficiency in whistling. Yeah. I'm glad you can relate. Sad. Yeah, relate. Sad. I hear you, sister. Uh so <laughs> Wait, I have to ask, how was that gonna relate to pink and sparkle? Oh, I, I, I thought it was going to be something along the lines of, oh, yeah, I um, curate cocktail dresses. I thought you were going to say something like that mm-hmm. as, as a skill or something of yours. I mean, I will say my best friend says I have excellent uh, skill at acquiring loud statement pants, if that can be a talent. Say more. <laughs> I just I really love huge pants with loud, flashy patterns. And I've been doing a lot of Etsy shopping during the pandemic and especially looking for like comfortable for the pandemic, but still stylish looks like I tried. So I yeah. found this company at Zanza Designs on Etsy. And this girl makes the most amazing pants. Like when I put them on, I feel like a cross between Selena and Elton John. And I just want to like dance through my house uh-huh. like through Harris Teeter or whatever. Uh, but so she's... <laughs> You know, I've given entirely too many pairs of these pants as gifts to people at this point. I don't know if anybody else is wearing them besides me, but yeah, uh, I like loud pants. <laughs> I like loud clothes in general. I, I, I can dig it. That, I feel like there's this part of that. Uh, it maybe it's a Caribbean thing. I don't know, but that is what I've noticed. I have a few friends, Dominican, Puerto Rican, what have you. And it's just like, that's what you're wearing. All right. And as they hang out with them for a while, I was like, oh, I put one of those types of shirts. I, this is a picture when I went up to New York and I was at a pizzeria and I was like, what is this Dominican shirt I'm wearing? I was like, and my chest hair is out. I was like, what am I doing? I was like, who, who is my, who are my friends? What'd you say? Yeah, I mean, these things start, they're rubbing off on you. These things start to look normal. Next thing you know, you're going to be covered in pink sparkles after yes. our conversation. And uh, that's the way it goes. That's, that's the goal. That's, that's living the dream. Um, so that's pretty much all the questions I have. Uh, I want to give you the opportunity because I give everyone opportunity to shamelessly pu- plug, 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 plug away, uh, social media, website, all of that good stuff. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I have work up at Creative Alliance now. I have their uh, window display that is Baltimore in bloom. So you don't even need to go inside. Go check that out. I will have work up in the big show at Creative Alliance as soon as that opens. I currently have work up at the Delaplane in Frederick. Uh, one of my nice pieces uh, called Rest in Pizza. It's an abandoned graffiti pizza hut. I have work in a show called Monochrome that opens up July 2nd. That's in Raleigh, North Carolina. And, uh, you know, stay tuned, follow the website, social media. Everything is just Rosa Leff, R-O-S-A-L-E-F-F. That's my Instagram, my website, and my Facebook. So there you have it, folks. I'm going to thank you, Rosa. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And um, I'll do my sign off. So for Rosa Leff, I'm Rob Lee saying that there's art in and around Baltimore. You just got to look for it. Oh,